Hello and welcome to the Cisco CyberOps Associate Lab video series. I'm going to be walking through each of the major labs of the Cisco CyberOps Associate Netacad curriculum. So let's go and let's jump on in. Alright, so in this lab we're looking at lab 426, working with the text files in the command line. So for this we're going to be using the official Cisco curriculum guide. And I have this guide off my screen just so that I can follow along. So again, we're just going through the three main parts, graphical text editor, terminal uh, text editor, and working with a uh, configuration file. The big thing to realize is we're only using the CyberOp workstation for this lab. And again, we're just working through it. Uh, one thing to note was that to keep these VMs kind of small, the CyberOps workstation only includes a few graphical text editors, this guy specifically, to keep it nice and small. So let's go ahead, let's jump in the lab, and let's see what we can do. All right, to get logged in, this is our analyst user. So the password should be CyberOps, spell it correctly, C Y B E R. OPS, all lowercase. I'm doing this as a VM, so like most of you using VMware Workstation, you should be able to get it to resize. If you can't, then that's okay as well. Trying to work with this small of a footprint, I mean it's doable, but if you go up here to application, go to settings, go to display, you can manipulate the resolution here. I'm going to go ahead and pump it up to 1400 by 1050. Let's see if that works. I'm going to bump it up a little bit higher, maybe 1680 by 10. All right, and for what I'm doing for my screen, that works. So again, for that part, just kind of match whatever review it's going to matter for your screen. I'm going to go ahead and hide my VMware taskbar so I can see my applications. All right, so once we get the display portion taken care of, we can move forward with the actual lab. Like I said, part one is using the graphical text editor. So again, we've already said that they're using the uh, CyTE for the graphical text editor. That's the one that's installed. So let's log into our VM. And we're logged in as our analysts. So let's go ahead and open up our text editor. So if we go to Applications, CyberOps, and from CyberOps, you'll notice that we have our idle, we have our Team, and our Wireshark. So we're going to open up our Team, And here is our text editor. This is a regular text editor. The lab wants us to copy this large string of text. Realistically, that part you, you really don't have to do. This is sample text. The big thing is we want to make sure that we understand that we can edit this command terminal. From here, let's go ahead and save it. So file save as I'm reading through the instructions and it just says notice where it goes to save it saves to the home directory of analysts so we may want to save it to somewhere else by default this is the home directory maybe we want to save it to our desktop I'm gonna save it to the desktop and make it a little bit easier example1.txt I like to put the extensions in just in case hit save and there's my example one I'm gonna do that again save as example 2 without the txt hit save just to show you that it still saves it as a text document, but you're not seeing the extension of TXT. So when we actually go to explore it, 
it does see it as a plain text document even if it's not there. So when we compare that to our example one, example one has our extension, example two does not. Is that a critical thing at the moment? No, but I did want to point that out. So let's go ahead and delete example two. The big thing is as we're working through this, make sure to do our extensions. So we've saved it. Let's go ahead and exit out of our reader. Go ahead and open up example one by double clicking on it. And you'll notice it opens up our reader again. That's pretty uh, self-explanatory. All right, so I'm gonna save this again, save as it originally had us save it to our home directory. So I'm gonna do that example three txt the reason I'm doing that is because we saved it to the home directory well, where is that well we have our home directory here and you can readily find it underneath our analysts home directory when we're looking at step one part F you'll notice it asks about opening the example text document but I wanted to, I saved it on my desktop the lab called it saving it to our home directory so I wanted to point out kind of the differences between the two so I'm gonna go ahead and delete my example one sorry my example three I'm leaving my example one on my desktop so even though it's looking for the correct directory If you do not use the appropriate extension, then sometimes the file applications may not be able to find it. So part 1G specifically is talking about the known extension of a text document. So if you did not save it as a text document, you may have issues. Open the text document and you'll see that it's there. While the Linux file systems don't rely on the extensions, some applications, such as IT, may attempt to use them to identify the file types. So Linux is not so much extension oriented, but it does make it a little bit easier for certain applications to find them. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to move on to step two, and that is going to be from the terminal. So I'm going to go ahead I'm going to rename my text document to space dot text and I'm going to put it in my home directory. I'm doing that specifically because the example is using space. So if you are following along, I want to make sure that you can understand what's going on. I'm going to go ahead and open up the terminal. First thing I'm going to do is an ls to see where I'm located. ls shows that I'm in my home directory, or if you're not quite sure, you can do a pwd, and that's the present working directory, and that shows that we're at the home analyst location. ls is like a dir, like a dir. Dir and ls, they're similar, though in Linux, ls is going to be way more powerful. It lists the contents of the directory. All right, so that shows our directory listing commands. So next, let's open up our space file from our command terminal. Since we know we're using our site file, so let's do S-C-I-T-E, all lowercase, space, the space.txt. Basically, what this is going to do is it's going to open up this application, the site application, and it's going to open up a specific text document once we hit enter. And there we go. Whatever text document you want to open, that's what you put there. This is the application that's going to be opening it. Why is the prompt not opening in the terminal, like why did it load this application? 
this is a GUI application that has a graphical component. So instead of opening up the text document in the terminal, it launches the application. Alright, so let's go ahead and close the instance by clicking the X. You'll notice in here, this is open. We don't have a new line. Like this is still showing it's running the application. So you can hit Control C and that will kill the application. I'm going to reopen it. Again, you notice that it doesn't give us a prompt again. It just gives us a new line. If we close out of the application, it then gives us back our terminal session. When we are starting from the command terminal, this will run as a elevated user root. So it simply proceeds with the this, if you want to run as an elevated user, you, you can as root, for example. If you want to run it, we could do up arrow, sudo, and then it will ask us for our user, cyber ops. And then it will launch it as a root user, meaning it's going to use the highest level of credentials. That is probably going to be overkill, but you may deal with permission issues later down the line where you're looking at how do I open certain files that are protected. If you have to elevate the privileges, we do that with a sudo. All right, so let's go ahead and back out of that and back out of our terminal. So that completes part one of the working with the text files in the CLI. In part two, we're going to be using the command line text editor. So we're not going to be working with a graphical text editor. All right, so let's move on with our command line text editor. Linux has tons of different command line editors. We're going to be focusing on Nano, which actually I'm really glad because that's the one that I prefer. We also have things like Vim if you want. Uh, again, Vim is another very common, very um, popular one. It's just that's not one that I thoroughly enjoy. With Nano, or the GNU Nano, most of it can be controlled all via keyboard. That way you can have quick, easy shortcut files. So let's get to it. Go to our command terminal. So let's open up Nano, file editor. If we just type Nano, it will, if you spell it correctly, that works better. And if you type Nano, it will go ahead and open up a blank document. If we do nano space txt, it will open up our specific text document. So that's what we're going to do, nano space txt. And you will notice it opened up our sample text. And it tells you what its version it is. I'm going to see if I can zoom in. That way, it's a little easier to read. Down here, we have the Control X, Control G, Control O, Control R. That way, you don't really have to use the mouse. And this is all via our command line. This is all via a keyboard. This is added when we did nano. So I added a, a new line. Again, this isn't part of the official curriculum, but I found that this kind of helps kind of solidify the, the concept. So let's go ahead and let's exit out. So control X, because I made a change, do I want to save? Yes, I do. And what do I want to name it, I can have it overwrite my space.txt and that's fine. And there it goes. So when I saved it, and I, I hit Y, it may not have actually showed up on the screen. So let's do that again. I'm going to hit the up arrow. I'm going to add in a third line. 
receiving, control X. Do I want to do it? Yes, I'm going to hit Y and you shouldn't see it prompt on the screen because it doesn't. And I'm going to go ahead and re save it as the same file type. So I'm going to overwrite space.txt. That's fine. And there we go. To control nano, you use control, alt, escape, or the meta type keys. The meta key is the keyboard on a Windows or a Mac. That's the uh, logo based keys, depending on your keyboard. To navigate in a nano, very user friendly, use the arrows, page up, page down. To spend some time in nano, uh, play with the help screen. To enter the help screen, you would hit control G. And to quit, you'd hit Q. So let's go back into nano. Control G. And here's our help. And you could use the arrow key to, to scroll down and see the shortcut keys. When you're ready to quit, hit lowercase Q. And there we go. I'm going to exit out. Control X. I didn't make any modification, so it's not going to prompt me to save anything. All right, so that completes part two. So I'm going to go ahead and open or close out of my terminal. Part three is working with the configuration files. So we're going to be using more LS based commands and we're going to do some basic navigation here in just a minute. So part one was using the graphical interface. Part two is using the terminal and using nano as the terminal editor. And now part three, we're going to jump into working with configuration files. All right, so part three has a few different parts. So it has step one, locating configuration files and navigation. Step two, editing and saving those configuration files. Step three, editing configuration files for services. And then we're going to end with a reflection. So we're going to be looking at config files. So when people ask, well, why is this lab important? It's not so much dealing with the editors. If you've been around technology long enough, you know how to work with an editor, both graphically and through a terminal. Maybe the terminal not so much, but a graphical editor, that's pretty common. But Linux is very, very file object oriented. Everything's a file. So even services, configuration files, all of those are objects that we're going to be able to have to manipulate. So that's where this lab comes into play. All right, so let's open up our application, go to our terminal. First thing that we want to do is do an ls. That lists our directory. But more importantly, let's learn some ls commands. So ls tac l. That's going to show us a, a breakdown of the user, the size, the date, and the time. So again, I'm going to manipulate the view. It also will show the directory, what permissions you have. So read, write, execute, read, execute, read, execute. And don't stress too much about understanding this just yet, because we'll have a lab explaining what that material is. While a few files are displayed, none of them are configuration files. Uh, you'll also notice there are no dots. So because it's a convention to hide the home directory host configuration file by preceding their name with a dot, so it might be dot something, those are going to be hidden files. So to show that graphically, I'm going to move my window to the side, go to my home directory. You'll see that we don't see it here. But when we opened up our application and we were saving as, notice all of these start with a dot. But where were these in that folder? They're there. They're just hidden from our view. So go ahead and close out of all of this. Go back to our command terminal. So ls does allow us to view them. We just need to add in 
an additional flag. So ls, tack l, and a. The a option will include hidden files in the output. So there's a lot more here. And that's going to show our parent directories. It's going to show all of our hidden folders. Again, what we do to hide them is we start them off with a dot, and that would then hide them or they'll be flagged to be hidden. We can use the cat command to display the contents of a resource. So I'm going to throw enter a few times. It wants us to cat or concatenate bash rc. Bash rc. Basically, that says open that file. So here we have a export editor. It's going to be Vim. And we have our alias, which is our colors. And then we have our alias VI, which is also Vim. So we don't have to worry too much about the syntax of the bash command at this point. It's important to notice that the bash contains configuration for the command terminal. The line PS1 equals slash bracket slash e yada 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 this line defines the prompt structure of the prompt being displayed basically it's going to say that the user logged in at the workstation name double check and make sure I didn't forget anything also that it shows prompt uh, displaying and the current directory that's what the till is it's followed by a dollar sign and all green a few other configurations could include a shortcut to ls and vim in this case every time a user types ls the shell automatically converts that to ls tack color to display a color coded output for the directories the directories will be in blue regular files in gray executable files in green. So let's scroll up and let's see if that's true. Blue are directories, regular files, gray, and I don't see any executable files in green. Could just be that in that instance we don't have it. So again, when we type ls, this is what's really running. ls tack tack color, when we type them, it's really running VIM. So that is what is underneath our bash resource. The specific syntax is out of the scope of this course, but it is important to kind of understand the user configuration and the convenience of storing hidden files in those home directories. If you want to be able to customize what the user is doing, you can do that. You also are not limited to only LSing a directory that you're currently in. For example, let's ls the etc or etc directory. ls space forward slash etc. That is going to say open up the or run the directory the ls command on the directory etc. You can give it its direct path. You could give it a non-direct path, but if you don't give it uh, the direct path, the non-direct path, it may not find it. So you may have to do, if it's a nested, you want to see the home folder of your user, maybe the desktop of that home user, well you couldn't just do desktop. You'd have to actually give it the entire path. So that's something to keep in mind. Alright, so we will go ahead and do etc. Again, scrolling up, it's color coded. We know that blue is directories. We know that gray is executable. We'll also notice that we're not seeing any hidden folders because we did not do the A command. So there are some options to review. All right, so we're gonna do the exact same thing. We're gonna go ahead and look at the bash dot bash resource. You can see it under B's bash we know that's a text document so just like we did up here if we cat 
the file, we can read it. So again, that is a little bit more outside the scope of the lab. It wants us to know that it's there, and the syntax of the bash is not really tied to us specifically. Meaning for this lab, it's going to be way outside the scope. So you'll notice we're not in the etc folder. So we're going to cat the direct path. So etc bash. And if you hit tab, you can auto complete a lot of the commands. And again, part of this is they have to be unique. I started with bas. So when it came to the bees, there was only two folders that start with or two files that started with bas. So bash logout and bash resource. And it did bash dot bash because it doesn't know what after that. So I'm going to do R, and I can tab the rest of it, and that will finish it. I'm going to hit enter, and again, there is so much extra stuff here. It's going to warn you if you're not doing this interactively, don't do anything. Just we're just looking, nothing else. Why are user application config, uh, configuration files saved in the user home directory and not under the etc folder with all of the other system wide configuration files? So that's a common question that we need to act to get a response to. And that's because the regular users do not have permission to write to the etc folder. So Linux is a multi user operating system. So it will place user application configuration files under the ETC. It would keep the users from being able to customize their applications. ETC is a secured directory. So anything that a user want to be able to handle or work with needs to be in an area that the user can actually access or have permission to access. So that's the primary reason. So what we're going to do it wants us for step two editing and saving the configuration files it's basically expected us that we've already logged out so let's log back in and let's open our graphical terminals so cyber ops it because the dot bash rc is a hidden file with no extensions we cannot actually see it we don't see it here. Because it's a hidden extension, it won't display it. What we can do is if we go to open and we go to all files, we have all so hidden files. We we have a lot that we can do. Do we see it in here? Well, I don't see it specifically. dot bash let's scroll up oh there it is it is a text file so we can open it so go ahead and open and here we are again you do want to be careful because we can do some serious damage can I zoom in there we go let me resize my window a little bit. All right, so we've opened up our file. Here we have this 32. They're flagging for some reason. Locate the 32 and replace it with 31. 32 is the color code for green. 31 is the color code for red. So delete. All right, once we do that, save exit. Basically we've just modified the color. So what we want to do is we want to go ahead and open up our terminal and let's see what it looks like. Basically why are we doing this? What we should be able to do is we're modifying 
the way that our terminal looks. We changed it from green to red. Is it a big deal? Not necessarily, but it, it all depends on the individual and kind of what they want. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and open up our nano. So nano and we're going to do dot bash rc and again we can see that through our command terminal let's change 31 to 33 we made the modification control x to save it yes to save it we're keeping the same name so what did we do 33 is the yellow, but our command prompt is still red. Well, let's go ahead and open a new terminal. So this was before we ran the nano command. So this was already loaded the configuration file. So it's going to keep the same old configuration. After we saved it, I opened up a new terminal and it takes the new color. That way you can see that it actually is loading and keeping some configuration files in memory. All right, so what we're gonna do is close one of these. I'm gonna modify my view again. Step three, editing configuration files for services. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to open up the engine x configuration file in nano the configuration file uh, used in this is the custom underscore server dot conf notice below we're going to be doing a sudo with attack l and the attack l basically switches to turn on the line numbering all right so what we're going to do is sudo that means Elevate our privileges. Nano tac L ETC in I'm gonna in G custom dot server conf. Because we did nano, it's gonna ask for the user password, cyber ops. And here we are. Here is our configuration file for the custom server. Use the arrow key, navigate through it. Conventionally, the .conf extension will be used to identify the conf. While the configuration file, look around. So, number lines. I am on step three part C and that is notice that that the bottom of the window above the nano command the number line is highlighted and listed on line 39 change the port from 81 to 8080 all right that was not all the way to the bottom but whatever from Sorry, it said line 39, so 39. We're going to change this to 8080. And all we're doing is, again, we're following the lab guide so that we don't manage to screw anything up. This will tell Nginx to listen for HTTP requests on port TCP 8080. So that's first thing. So instead of listening on port 81, we've changed it to port 8080. Now go to line 47. And this is looking at the location root user share nginx HTML. That's the path. It wants us to change it to text ed lab. So we're going to add at the end of the HTML the user share nginx html we're going to 
add text underscore ed underscore lab forward slash. That is a new directory. All right, so it does have a, be careful not to remove the semicolon. Semicolon's important. Because at the end of the line or Nginx will throw an error when trying to do anything with it. All right, press Control X to save it and back out of it. We're gonna go ahead and run our file. All right, so Control X, Y, Enter. It wants us to go ahead and open up Nginx and run this config file. So sudo in G I N X tack C you can't cust uh, you cannot tab this out so custom server make sure you spell it all correctly server dot com sudo in GX tack C custom server X dot com all right once we hit enter, that should have gone ahead and loaded the configuration into Nginx. So what we're going to have to do next is open up our web browser, multimedia, nope, system, nope, oh, probably where it says web browser. And we can use localhost, or we can use the 127 address, or we can use the machine's IP address. It kind of all depends up to you. We're going to go ahead and do 127.0.0.1, port 8080. And that loaded our test file. And again, it's listening on port 8080 because we told it to. When we ran it, we did get this error message. The user share text ed lab icon failed because there's no such file or directory. To, to pull that icon. Basically, the file didn't exist. It did an error, and that's okay. So after successfully opening up the page, which uh, is the error messaging referring to. Basically, it's saying that we don't have the file that it's requesting. Specifically, the error message was generated by the successful web page connection and seems to be caused by a missing fav.ico file in the lab support file directory. That directory is not there, so the icon is missing. So to go ahead and shut down the server we can hit enter we've already closed all out of all of it to shut down the nginx web server press enter in the command prompt and we're going to go ahead and kill it all right so we're going to do a sudo pkill nginx n-i-n-g-x and that turned off Okay, that, that turned off our Nginx, so that should have killed it. So, can we test whether the server has been shut down? The web page is still going, so what's going on? It took a minute and it finally did kill the, the site. If you refresh it, you're going to see that it's not actually loading. If you just hit enter, it has a cached copy. Refresh, gone. So, challenge question Can we edit the custom config file with script? Sure. 
from its terminal window we can do a sudo uh, script.exe or the directory path to the configuration file and that would load the, conf uh, the configuration file if we wanted to do that. So I'm going to go up a few. S C I T E Here we go. It's not numbered, but we can do it. The big thing is what you can do graphically, you can do via the command terminal. They're they're different. Not saying one is better than the other, but they're different. All right, so reflection questions. Depending on the service, more options are available. We already know that. Permissions are a very uh, real issue, and it's a common cause of problems. So we need to understand and make sure that we're using the correct permissions. Putting files in certain areas may have them inherent permissions that we don't think about. So do keep that in mind. All right, so that brings us to the end of lab four. Two, six, working with text files in the command terminal. Questions, concerns, or anything, definitely feel free to reach out. Thank you. All right, so that does it for this lab video. A few suggestions would be, one, run through the lab a second time, trying to do it by yourself. Two, I would do a summary of kind of what you learned, where you struggled, and keep that type of journal going so that you can build off of it. Third, and finally, take time to reflect. These labs start off fairly easy, and then they grow in complexity, so some of the labs you may have to redo a few times to fully grasp what's going on. If you have any questions or any concerns, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.